exalts you in this place. High above every other name. The name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. We serve a great God. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. I'm grateful that he's able to meet us wherever we're at. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. You know, as we do so many times and just take the time and come to the altar, sometimes we come just to find a place at the, at the altar to kneel and just to take time alone with God. Sometimes it's wonderful to know that we can come to the, to the altar and that there'll be somebody here to, to pray with us, somebody to encourage us. And that's the wonderful part of the body of Christ is that we're never alone. First of all, God has said he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us. But above that, the church is so important today because it's a place where we can come and we can find strength. It's a place where we can come and find friendship. It's a place where we can find encouragement in what Christ has for us. And I'm thankful that, that we do each and every week, just take that time to allow God to move in our hearts and move in our lives. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you take and turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll be looking there a little bit this morning. But uh, Pastor Micah, you'll never be a good youth pastor. You stink. The only thing you have going for you is your wife. Not going to happen. Woody, I don't know why you bother getting your license to preach. You're too old. You're never going to make it. Who's going to listen to an old man? I mean, come on. Somebody that looks like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Sell me some chicken, I might listen, but I don't know. Suzanne, you're the most amazing woman in the world. <laughs> Phyllis! ever told you you could play the piano? I heard stories about you when you first played that you used to stand backwards. It's amazing. Sometimes in life, we're rejected. Sometimes in life, people will tell us things, they'll look at us and say, you can't do what God wants you to do. And if you listen to the voice of the naysayers, I guarantee you, you will never do what God wants you to do. You see, rejection comes in our life all the time. Teenagers, people will say, y'all, Yo, you'll never grow up to amount to anything. Your parents might even say, ah, you're worthless. You were a mistake. I didn't even really want to have you. But if you're listening to the voice of this world, I guarantee you this, the voice of the world will always tear you down. The voice of the world will always limit the potential that God has birthed inside of you. When it comes to being rejected, we're rejected all the time by, by, by so many different people. We're rejected in so many different areas of life. And this morning I want us to begin to take a look as we've been going through our, our series on heroes and what has made them the hero? I want you to listen to this passage that the psalmist David wrote in Psalm 27. Verse number 7, he says this, he says, Lord, hear me when I call. Have mercy and answer me. My heart said of you, go worship him. So I come to worship you, Lord. I don't know why you came to church this morning, but I hope it's for this reason. Lord, I came to worship you. If you're here this morning just simply because you, you want to make your appearance and say, well, I went to church on Sunday, then you're, you're here for the wrong reason. If you're here because somebody invited you to come, man, that's wonderful. We're so glad that you're here. But as we come, we need to be like David and say, Lord, I have come to worship you. Verse 9, he says, don't turn away from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have helped me. Do not push me away or leave me alone. Seems like David's going through a difficult time. Where's everybody else? God, I'm coming to you, so Lord, don't you push me away as well. Lord, don't turn me away. Lord, I'm coming to you. 
Don't push me away or leave me alone, God my Savior. Verse 10, if my father and mother leave me, then in the Lord's, in the Lord's, I know that I will be taken in. No matter who rejects you in this world, no matter what rejection you go through in life, you must always know this, just as the psalmist David said, I will always find that God will take me in. That in God's eyes, I am highly favored. In God's eyes, I am a child of the king. You see, the truth is this morning, we've all experienced rejection on some level. We've all experienced rejection on some level, and it has a special way of shaking us up. When we're rejected, we can get a little bit worked up on the inside. Maybe you've been rejected in romance and friendship. You've been rejected by an organization. You're rejected in school. You get rejected at work, and one of the hardest rejections to take place is when we're rejected by our family. We get shaken up, and sometimes our rejection brings us to tears. It can crush us. It can, it can break our souls. Whenever we experience re rejection, we tend to ask ourselves the question that begins with, what's, what's wrong with that person? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? Or then we ultimately turn it back and say, well, if they reject me, what's wrong with me? You see, that's the way the enemy works. That's the way the devil turns what God desires into a plan of destruction. By getting us to focus on what's wrong rather than on who is right. And we start turning it to ourselves and we experience re rejection. We say, well, why didn't I get the job? Why didn't I get that girlfriend or boyfriend? Why didn't I get the grade that I deserved? And we begin to focus on the whys and the what ifs rather than on the who is and who is to come. You see, it's not how we should respond as Christians, but I understand that a lot of times that's the way we do respond. We sit there and we say, well, what did I do wrong? How can I change this? What, what could I have done? Or what did that person do? Why did they do this to me? We've been on a discovery of the heroes in the Bible, men and women that stand out among the crowd. We've been looking at their stories, what made them stick out in the eyes of, of man, but even more importantly, what made them stand out so much in God's eyes that God took and he wrote their stories in this book that he has given us today. What is the story of their life that we can glean from, that we can learn from, and say, man, I want that character trait in my life. I want what Daniel had in my life. I want what Noah had. I want what Elijah had. I want what Esther had, what Ruth had. When we look at their lives, we, we look at them and we say, this is what I desire in my life. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be diving into the life of David. I, I tried to figure out if we could cram David's story into like one or two messages, and I don't think we're going to be able to. I'm not sure how many weeks we're going to look at the life of David, but we're going to take David, and, and, and I just feel we're going to lead up into the Christmas season, looking at the life of David, because we find that it was because of David that we find the lineage of Jesus Christ. So it's kind of a natural flow leading us into the Christmas season. But our goal in this journey is to see what made David to be known as a man after God's own heart. Why was David known as a man after God's own heart? I mean, David was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. David had many, many flaws. He had many shortcomings. And yet when God looked, he said, here is a man after my own heart. And so we're going to look at his story, we're going to look at his life, and we're going to say, okay, Lord, because I see in him... I see in David these characteristics, these qualities. Lord, I want them say, those same characteristics and qualities to be in me. Lord, I want people to say of me, there goes a man after God's own heart. There goes a woman after God's own heart. So I want us to start the journey of David's life, kind of like we did when we looked at Daniel, and going back to the very beginning of David's life. And we find that David's life actually started out with a period of rejection. And it begins in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the story of Daniel's life does not even begin with focusing on, da on David, sorry, not Daniel, on David, not focusing on David, but it begins by focusing on King Saul. Look at this, if you would, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons 
to be king. We find in this passage that Samuel's upset. Samuel's all worked up. He's, he, his spirit is pretty much broken because this king saw that, that he had anointed to be the first king of Israel. Basically, Saul is letting down the children of Israel, and he's letting down God. Saul is turning and going away against the things of God. And we find Samuel just a little bit depressed, a little despondent. If you look back to chapter 15, you find that, that, that Saul really blew it in, in Agog, and, and, and he, he messed things up. And here we find Samuel saying, God, what are we going to do? As a result of his latest sin against God, God looked down and said, Saul, I'm, I'm removing my favor from you. Saul is rejected by God, and so God gives Samuel this secret mission. The secret mission to go and crown the next king of Israel. To go to the town of Bethlehem. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> go to the town of Bethlehem, and there you will find the next king. You see, all through Scripture, from the very beginning to the very end, everything is tied into who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did for us. And so we find here a connection that, that Samuel goes to Bethlehem to search for the next king when the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ, would be born in Bethlehem. Look at verse number two. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord." Now we have to remember that Bethlehem is really a, a little know-nothing town. No one ever really visited Bethlehem for their vacation. Nobody really said, oh, I'm going to go down the, down the mountain into Bethlehem to do my shopping. Bethlehem was just a little no-name town. And yet God had great plans for the city of Bethlehem. God had great plans for this little no-name town. The same way that God has plans for your life. The same way that God has a purpose for your life. He has something with inside of you that he is looking and he's saying, go to Bethlehem. Because there you'll find the answer. Here comes this prophet of God into this little village. And I guarantee you that as the people saw Samuel coming in, they're thinking, oh no, what did we do wrong? Because he was a prophet of God and he would, he would oftentimes speak judgment upon people. He'd oftentimes speak the word of God to people. And they, they're probably going, what in the world is Samuel doing coming to our little town of Bethlehem? Look at verse 3. It says, invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you should do. You shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. It'd be like... A, the chair of the Republican Party coming and stopping by Altoona and saying, well, I need to find a family that has a lot of boys. Uh, let's check out the Moyer family. There, there's four boys in that family. And we'll, we'll line them all up and, and, and we'll pick the next president to run, the next person to run for president on the Republican Party. We'll pick them out of the Moyer family. Basically what Jesse's doing here, or what Samuel's doing with Jesse's family, he steps down and he says, okay, bring me your son. Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They said, do you come in peace? Verse 5, Samuel replied, yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Here comes Samuel, unannounced, into Jesse's house. He gets his sons to line up before him. These are the boys that he will choose to find the next king, the next one to lead the people of Israel. Verse number six, he says, when they came, Samuel looked at Eliab and he thought, surely, <laughs> I mean, look at this guy, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Here came Eliab, the oldest son, Surely this is the one that God desires to be the next leader of Israel, to be the next king of Israel. You see, he was looking at his appearance. He said, oh, Eliab's a good-looking man. All the ladies are going to love him. He's big and strong. He's rough and tough. He's a man's kind of man. All the guys are going to appreciate him. Look at this guy. He has to be the one. But listen to what happened here in verse number 7. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord 
looks on the hearts. Stop looking on the outside and start looking on the inside. Stop judging the book by its cover. And yet in our society, in our day and age, that's what we do with most people. We look at them and we, we give them a label just by their appearance. When God says, wait, what's on the inside is what matters. God says no because he could care less about the way we look on the outside. It's not our appearance that matters most to God. In fact, a little bit later on, we'll see exactly where Eliab's heart is in a couple passages later when David stands against the lies of the giant Philistine. We'll find where Eliab's heart is. Look at verses number 8 through 11. Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. Samuel said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? He said, there remains yet the youngest, but... He's out taking care of the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. One by one, Jesse's sons pass before Samuel, and one by one, God proceeds to say, no, that's not the right one. No, that's not the chosen one. Can you see Samuel just kind of sitting there going, huh, this is getting a little bit weary, God." Why isn't it the oldest? Why isn't it the strongest? Why isn't it the best looking? Why isn't it the smartest son? God, all these sons have been brought before me. God, how can you not pick one of these? Samuel's probably thinking, man, did I hear from God right? Did I go to the, the right house? Did I, did I go to the right house of Jesse? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be looking for Jesse's boys, but I should be looking for Jesse's girls. I mean, they might be the ones to look at. God says, no, you're in the right house. And it gets to that point where Samuel finally says, okay, Jesse, I, I hate to ask this question, but do you have any other boys? Do you have any other sons? Jesse goes, well, now that you mention it, I do have one other son. I, I forgot all about him. You ever feel like that son that's forgotten about, that daughter that's forgotten about? Oh, yeah, I, I do have one other son, but, but he's out taking care of the sheep. His name's David, but eh, he's just a punk little kid. You know, why, why would God choose him to be the king? That's why I didn't, I didn't even bother calling him in because there's no way that God would choose him. Pretty much when you read the story, you see that David is rejected by his father. He's rejected by his family just because he was the smallest. He was the nobody. He thought that he would not be qualified. He was just a little shepherd. God wouldn't choose the next king. Of Israel to be a shepherd. Look at verse number 12. It says, He sent and brought him in. He was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said this. He said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. The world was looking at all the other boys and saying, Oh, I want this one. I want that one. Yeah, this will be a great king. That'll be a great king. Always rejecting even the thought of David's. But God says to Samuel, arise and anoint David. He is the one. Even though he was rejected, even though he was out in the field, even though he wasn't considered, what mattered was that God was looking down and God saw his heart and God said, this is the one. This is the man that I want to be, the next king of Israel. This is the one that I have chosen. This is the one that is right. In the midst of being rejected by everyone else, David was chosen by God. Friends, listen, you can be rejected by everybody else in this world, but what matters is have you been chosen by God? We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, holy and righteous before him. See, I don't really take much stock in what everybody else says about me. Because you see, when I get to heaven, it's not what everybody else says about me that counts. It's what God says about me that's going to count. 
And yet we allow for ourselves to get so caught up in what everybody else thinks. We've got to keep up with the Joneses. We have to keep up with the, with, with the latest technology. We have to do this. We have to do that. Why? Because we're trying to impress everybody but God. When God's there in heaven and he calls us home, whether by death or whether by the resurrection of the saints, when Christ comes again and we stand before him, He's not going to say, what did everybody think about you down on earth? He's going to say, why should I let you in? And we're going to say, because my heart was given over to Jesus Christ. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. What was David going to do? His own dad didn't even believe in him. There was a proper underdog tale. It was this tale of David the beginning of David's life, the beginning of his adventure, all of a sudden David goes from nothing to being anointed the king of Israel. Kind of that that moment where he goes from nothing to superhero. That's what we would think would take place here. That moment where he says, hallelujah, finally they see it in me. I'm Batman. That moment when MI6 says to Bond, Bond, we have a mission for you. There's some bad guys we want you to go out and take care of. And Bond says, yes, I'll take that mission. Just give me a couple gadgets here and there, and I will go and defeat the bad guys. The point that of the story, if this was a tale of the underdog just rising instantly to, to be able to conquer those around him, that says you can go from nothing to something instantaneously. But that's not how the story goes. That's not how the story winds up. See, we find that the adventure of David is one that is played out back on the field, tending the sheep. It doesn't matter how great he thought he would be as a king. It didn't matter if he was going to be the next king. What really mattered was, was his heart ready. David didn't walk around saying, ha, I'm the next king. Dad, you go send the other boys out to take care of the sheep. It's not the lesson we learn because we find that for the next 15 years, for 15 years, David is out continuing to take care of the sheep. You see, just because you're chosen doesn't mean it's exactly your time yet. Just because you're chosen doesn't mean it's your time yet. Woody, chosen by God. It's your time now. (laughs) We follow the plan that God has for us. God may speak something into your life at a young age, and, and God has called you, God has chosen for you for something great, but it's not the time yet. But in his time, God makes all things beautiful. In fact, right after this, seven verses later, we come across Saul. We find King Saul freaking out with an evil spirit upon him. The Bible tells us that that Saul is going crazy. Apparently, the only thing that can get Saul Saul to calm down is by having music played. So he tells his people, he says, I I, I need somebody. Go find somebody that can play some music, that that can calm this evil spirit within me. And it's amazing how God works. One of his people say, oh, you know what? I I was out at a shepherd conference one time and I heard this guy David playing a harp. (laughs) Let me me go get David. Let me bring David in. David's called in. 1 Samuel 16, verse 19, it says, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. 15 years later, Saul is tormented by an evil spirit. He only can calm down by having music played. And so he sends for Jesse's son, David, who 15 years later is still found out with the sheep. You see, this is a character quality of David that we all need to understand, that we all need to grasp. Right after Samuel anointed him as the next king of Israel, after God had chosen him, he went back to his day job. Back to his status as least. 
You see, Samuel didn't start David's grand adventure. Samuel left and David's family went right back rejecting him. Think about it for a second. God told him, you're going to be king of my chosen people. I've handpicked you to lead my people. I've selected you to rule over the chosen people, the one nation that are my people. David, I have chosen you. And what's he doing? He's taking care of the sheep. Back to his normal routine of just taking care of the sheep. How frustrating that would that be for us? How frustrating that would that be for us to say, hey, you're going to be the next president of the United States, but uh, you got to wait 15 years. And until then, you, you just got to go through taking care of sheep out in the pasture. But that's what he's doing. He's taking care of the sheep back to his normal routine. You see, we want David to respond differently. We want David to respond the way that we would respond. Okay, David, Jesse says, okay, David, that, that was fun. You're anointed, but hey, uh, now it's time to go back to the sheep. And for David to say, oh, no, 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 no. Didn't you see what just happened here, Dad? <laughs> I'm the next king of Israel. Why don't you go take care of the sheep? That's the way we would think it would respond. I'm the king now. But that's not how he responds. He says, I'll go back out and tend to the sheep. Like the sorry people who are lied to by their friends and family. Many times they're told, you can do this, you can do that. And yet when they go out and try and do something, they're not ready for it. It cracks me up watching these, these music I, reality shows, American Idol and The Voice and them. It cracks me up, these people that they get out there and, and they sing, and well, they, they attempt to sing, they really don't sing. <laughs> they, they make a noise and, and, and it's just horrible. And then you hear them say, oh, but my mom said I can sing really good. Oh, my friends tell me I sing really good. That's because you're drunk out of your mind at a karaoke bar. They, they would think a cow sang good. Oh, you sound so... Yeah, no. Not so much. You see, the rejection that, that comes there, but David responded to the rejection with faithfulness. And he went back and he prepared himself for what God had for him. He didn't say, it's my time now. I'm going to get up on the stage of life and make a joyful noise. He said, no, I'm going to go back out and tend to my sheep. We see David respond to rejection by being faithful with what he had been given because he trusted that God was working through that rejection. See, I'm not going to ask myself, how do I get that? Why do they have what, what I want? Or what can I do to achieve my, my goal in life? No, we need to ask, what has the Lord given me? What has God placed in my hand? What has God gifted me with? And whatever it is that he has gifted me with, Lord, that is what I'm going to use today to be faithful to you. See, the truth is that God loves to work through people who have been rejected. God loves to work through the rejects. So this morning, just look at yourself and say, hey, I'm a big reject, okay? <laughs> We're all rejects. We're all rejects. We've been flawed by sin. If we were to go through the line before God in our sin, he'd say, nope, rejected, you can't get into heaven. Nope, rejected, you can't get into heaven. Nope, rejected, you can't get into heaven. But God comes down and through his grace and through his mercy, he sends his son to forgive us of our sins. And when his blood cleanses us of our sins, we can now pass before God and say, yep, the world's rejected you, but now you're chosen. The world had rejected David, but now he was being chosen. God loves to work through people. When you look at the biblical heroes of, uh, uh, of the Bible, we find that so many of the men, so many of the women, the guys and gals were simply rejects. People who we love and admire in Scripture today were the rejects of their time. They were fishermen. Nobody walked around saying, hey, yeah, I want to be a fisherman. I'm going to listen to these fishers of men. Yeah, they, they sound like great guys. Now, the fishermen were the bottom of the totem pole. When you look at some of the heroes in the Bible, you find, whoa, she was a prostitute? God chose a prostitute? He used a prostitute? You know, in our day and age, what do we do? We reject and throw away and say, yeah, you're worthless. I'm not going to even bother with you. But God said, no, I'm going to redeem you. What the world rejects, I'm going to redeem. God looks at the widows. He looks at the orphans and says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to reuse you. People we find in Scripture who repeatedly God chooses to use and do amazing things for Him. God loves to work through those who have been rejected. 
That's why eternal life is possible thanks to the rejection experienced by Jesus Christ. Salvation for you and for me is only made possible. Listen, it is only made possible through a rejected Jesus. The Bible says the world did not accept him. They would not acknowledge him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So what did they do? They had him beaten. They had him crucified on a cross. It was because he was rejected by man that we have salvation today. God uses the rejection and the rejects of this world for his purpose and for his glory. We live today because Jesus Christ, God himself, was rejected. We live today because God has chosen us. He has selected us. He has called us to be faithful right where we are at today. How many years ago did Phyllis first step on the platform just nervous and shaking? (laughs) I can't do this. And now, look, man, she's always all the way up to the front, and she's ready to come down there. And... Whoo! God uses us. God can use you, teenager, for something greater than what you even have planned. God can use you, senior citizen. Sorry, prime timer. God can use you. Even when everybody else says, ah, you've had enough. You see, like David, we should respond to rejection by being faithful and saying, Lord, I am trusting in you for your greater plan in my life. Jesus says this in Luke 17. He said, be faithful in the little things. Be faithful with what God has given you. David was being faithful with the little thing, just taking care of the sheep. What is the little thing that God has given to you? And he's just saying, be faithful with it. Trust me with it. Just be used in that area. Don't ask what's wrong. Why don't I get this or get that? Instead, what do I have that I can use for God's glory? What is it that I have in my possession today that I can be faithful with? Sometimes it's hard. It's difficult to to keep that, that mindset. But it's the mindset that God wants us all to have. It's the one characteristic that David had that made him the man after God's own heart. The fact that he was able to respond to rejection by trusting in God's plan and God's faithfulness. The problem for so many of us today is we have these delusions of grandeur. We have these these big ideas of the way things should be in our life. We think everything should just be handed to us without having to put out any time or hard work. We have become a society that says, I deserve it, I deserve it. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Instead of a society that says, Lord, thank you for what you have given me, I will use it for your glory and your honor. And Lord, in being faithful in a few things, that verse goes on to say, I will make you ruler over many. I will give you much more to be in charge of. You see, it was because David was faithful in just taking care of the sheep that God said, I will raise you up in that faithfulness and I will make you the king of Israel. Last week I was watching a TV show with, with my wife, the, the new TV show out called Girl Meets World. And they took the time during the TV show just to, to explore the idea of kind of being faithful with the little things, looking past the ordinary things. And it took these junior high kids, and it told them for the week they would have to work within the school system in some area of the school and and the, dreaded, the two most dreaded jobs were cafeteria assistant and janitor assistants. And these kids thought, ah, it's going to be hard, it's going to be tough work. But in the end, they've come to realize that if it's not for the cafeteria workers, there's no food for them to eat during the week. There's no trays that are clean to eat off of. If it's not for the janitor in the school, the floor is not clean, the garbage is overflowing, the bathrooms are disgusting. And these kids recognize, hey, if you're faithful with just some of these littler things, it changes your perspective. I mean, how many of us really think that when we walk into to the church on Sunday that it's going to be just clean and beautiful because nobody was here cleaning during the week? You see, it takes efforts, being faithful in those little things. Thank you, Linda, for doing a great job cleaning. (laughs) 
But what if Linda just stopped? What would we do? We'd complain, wouldn't we? Oh, it's disgusting. I can't believe this. Can you see that? What happens when those little jobs go unnoticed or go undone? They go noticed. What happens if David says, I'm not going to take care of the sheep? The sheep run away. They're devoured. There goes income for the family. It's being faithful in the little things. You see, friends, God's solutions are often strange and simple. So be open. God's solutions are often strange and simple, so we need to be open. Stop trying to make God so complex and complicated. God isn't. Saul was a big hot mess, and Samuel could have been going out of his mind trying to come up with a solution. How do I fix Saul? But God simply said this to Samuel. He said, go where I tell you. I have the answer. Stop trying to figure it all out and just listen to the voice of God. God said to Samuel, go where I tell you. I have the answer. I will point out the man. Follow me and I'll show you. Church, following God's will is not complicated. Just stay open to his solutions. Listen for his voice, not the voice of the world. God's promotions are usually sudden and surprising, so better be ready. I'm sure we've all heard the saying, when you least expect it, expect it. The Bible announces that the return of Christ from heaven will be this way. It will be sudden and surprisingly. Luke chapter 21 tells us that he will come in a cloud with power and with great glory. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says this. It says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of all, call of God. And those who have died believing in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be gathered up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Be encouraged, church, that Jesus Christ is coming in. We don't know the time, we don't know the hour, but he says he is coming with power. He's coming with a loud shout, with the sound of a trumpet. He will come to take us home. Just like that. Like a thief in the night. That's how God's promotions are handed out to us. You see, God is watching, God is looking. Who is being faithful with the few things? Who is being faithful with the little things? Who is being faithful with that that one task that I gave him? Now I can promote them and give him even greater things. And when we least expect it, in the middle of watching his sheep, God shows up for David. And he says, well done, good and faithful servants. Well done, David, good and faithful servant. I have a reward for you. You're going to be the king of Israel. Finally, God's selections are always sovereign and sure. So be sensitive. God's selections are always sovereign and always sure. Friend, listen. God did not make a mistake when he created you. God did not make a mistake when he called you. God did not make a mistake when he spoke to your heart and said, this is what I have for you to do. God's selections are sure. God's selections are sovereign. But we need to be sensitive. Be sensitive to the leading of God when it comes to choosing a spouse. Teenagers, be sensitive to the leading of God when it comes to dating that boy or girl. Because somebody will lead you closer to God and somebody will pull you farther away. Be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God when it comes to where you work, what you're doing. Don't settle for second best because second best is still a loser. I want the best for God that he has for me. Be sensitive to the changes that God may have coming your way, changes at work, changes at school, even changes here at church. Be sensitive to the changes that God brings about even if you think Things should remain the same. God can bring about change. You see, church, God is raising up co-laborers. He's anointing people other than you to do the job as well. Jesse's sons lined up. Yep, I'm going to be the next king. Pick me, Samuel. I know I'm the next king. But all along, God had somebody all the way out in the field planned. 
Why? Because God raises up co-laborers. He raises up other people beside us to do the work of the kingdom. It's not your calling and your calling only. It's not your gift and your gift only. God has imparted into us spiritual gifts and God wants us all to use our gifts for his glory and for his honor. And you know what? If you're saying, well, they shouldn't use their gift. I'm the only one that should use my gift. Then you know what you're doing? You're rejecting God's anointed one. You're rejecting the call upon their life and you're saying, "Uh uh-uh, it's only me. When God is saying, wait a second, it's more than you. I have called and chosen many. I have called and raised up many for the work of the kingdom of God. God is looking at our church. He's looking at our neighbors. He's looking at our towns. He's looking for you and for I to step up his people who can say, Lord, here I am. Your faithful servant, use me. And for God to say, yes, I see you. I want to use you. You see, church, our calling is to be faithful in the demanding tasks, whether that is our education our marriage, our occupation, or just the daily grind of life. Charles Swindoll says that's the kind of men and women God wants us to be. The kind of men and women that God wants to use. Those that are faithful in the demanding tasks of life. The question this morning, will you be found faithful like David? Have you been found faithful like David? Everybody else is rejecting you. You're doing a worthless job of taking care of the sheep, but God's looking down and saying, man, you're doing a great job. Keep it going, keep it going, because I'm going to reward you. I'm going to reward you. You will see it was in his due diligence of being faithful with that which was little that God said, David, (laughs) I'm going to pour my anointing oil upon you. You know, it's amazing when Samuel showed up Samuel didn't show up with a little vial of oil and say, bring your sons. No, when Samuel showed up, he came with a pitcher of oil. All the other boys were rejected. But when David comes, he kneels before Samuel. And God says, this is the one. Anoint him. And Samuel takes that pitcher of oil. And as David is kneeling there, he pours that oil down the top of his head. And that oil covers his head, his shoulders, his arms. It flows all the way down. Covers his feet. When God calls you and chooses you, He tells us to do something. It's amazing how these correlate. He says, be baptized. Be baptized. How do we baptize? We immerse, we completely put the body under the water. See, the Bible says you're buried to the old way and you're raised to newness of life. The old way of David was being buried at that point. Oh, he was still maturing. He was still growing in in, in his faithfulness to God. But the old way was being buried, and now he was the king. See, when we give our life to Christ, the old is buried. And he says, child, you're mine. I have given you life. Will you be faithful in the small things? Mom and dad, will you be faithful in the small things. Will you raise your children to love the Lord by being an example? Not by being a voice, but by being an example. When you go to work tomorrow, are you going to go in grumbling and complaining like everybody else? You're going to go in and say, God, you've placed me here for a reason. I'm not sure exactly what it is. These people are all nuts. They're crazy. But God, I know you're here. I'm here for a reason. So God, I want to make the most of this today. Give me the opportunity to be a light and a witness. If I can speak to somebody, so be it. If not, I will do my best. Whatever my hand finds to do, I will do it all for the glory of God. Shepherd. Accountant, grocery bagger, worker at McDonald's, it doesn't matter. Wherever it is, 
God, I am here. And I'm going to use my, what you've blessed me with for your glory and for your honor. Can we stand this morning? Hallelujah. Where are you at in your life? Are you one of those here this morning that thinks you deserve more? <laughs> you deserve more status. You deserve more in your life. Or are you here like David, just simply going about the work that he has for you? Being that shepherd's. Have you been rejected? Rejected by family, rejected by loved ones, rejected by people at work? Are you that one that you hear people laughing and you take it to heart? Stop. Because God is dancing over you this morning. God is looking down and saying, Oh, I love you. I care about you. You're precious. You're beautiful. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy. Stop taking in those voices that are trying to destroy you. Listen to my voice. Listen to what my words have to say. Listen to what the scriptures have to say. I have come to give you life and give it to you in the fullest. That's our desire. Lord, here I am. I want to be like David. Give me a shepherd's heart. Father, this morning your word has told us the beginnings of David's life. The beginning story. And when we find David for the first time, we find him in a field taking care of sheep. Lord, when we look down and we look into our lives, where is it that you first found us? Maybe for some of us who are here this morning, we're, we're like that young man that Pastor Jack talked about several weeks ago. Jesus found him in a bar. And the man said, I can't do this anymore. And he ran out of there, ran 